into the into the church driveway this morning. Lee's sermon topic this morning is what's in a name. I think he stole it from Shakespeare. But uh, in any case, uh, since we're talking about names, let's uh, sing the first and last verses of number 536, Precious Name. Seven zero. Well, I hope this is one I know, JD. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Good morning. I want to welcome you to this worship service at Bella Vista First United Methodist Church. I'm excited to welcome you here, and I hope that as you worship, you will feel the power of God's presence. You will feel the truth of his hope, and that you are inspired by Pastor Lee's message this morning. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Good morning. Good to see everyone here. If you're a guest, thank you for worshiping with us. We appreciate it. If you're a guest for the first time, please do not leave until you have a chance to give us your name and address. If you will do that on the little table out in the narthex, later in the week someone will stop by your home and they will leave a mug for you. That mug is filled with brochures and information that tells about the many ministries and the many things that go on in this church that, that no doubt you will find something in there that really appeals to you. So enjoy the fellowship this morning and uh, get to know our church a little bit better by grabbing some of that information uh, as soon as you're able. Uh, just want to say that uh, if the attendance pads haven't been passed, please do that now or pass them to anybody that's come into the pew. Uh, as you know, we like to know that you're here and we can figure out who's not here if you will be diligent in signing, in signing that attendance book. We hope that you will, will help us with that. If you will turn in your bulletins to the announcements, I've got a couple things that I want to say. First of all, I want to talk about this golf trophy 
And this was given, uh, there was the 16th annual Shrine Golf Classic. They do this every year, and it is done where they challenge church teams to play against one another so that they can raise money to take care of kids and get them into the hospitals where they need to be. It's a wonderful cause, and it just so happens that this year, the winner of that was the team from our church. And our three people that played on that team were Mac McCain and Bill Dannenauer and Gary Grossnickel. An another person that joined them was Bob Billingsley. So they are really proud of that. We get to display this in our church for this next year. Next year, if someone from our church wins again, then we will keep this trophy. So it's a neat thing, all for, all for charity, and uh, we appreciate our folks that went out and won that, uh, representing our church. All three of uh, those gentlemen were in church this morning. We were able to give them a, a big round of applause. I want to tell you that we've been talking about that rummage sale forever and ever and ever, and it's almost here. This Saturday will be the rummage sale. We hope that if you have not contributed to it, they are going to still give you some time this week to be able to bring your rummage in here. Um, they, they're looking forward to receiving that and, and they're looking forward to help. So there is a sign-up sheet in the library. If you haven't had a chance to sign that, please do that. This is a church-wide thing and it's, it's a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful event that helps to raise a lot of money for charities in our area. Along with the rummage uh, sale this year is going to be the spe a special missions project clothing sale. So they will be going on at the same time. That will be done by the missions team and all the money that's collected from that will go to Habitat for Humanity Apostle Build for the, the new home that's being built. Um, I want to let you know that those who are in the choir or want to be in the choir, uh, they are resuming practice this Thursday at 3.30. So remember to come for that. And those people who play in the chancel bells, they will resume practice this Wednesday at 3.30 as well. So that is all the news that I have to share with you right now. Let's praise the Lord and hear from Danette. Three decades, thousands of volunteers in nearly 90 countries around the world. 300,000 houses, 1.5 million people living in simple, decent homes. Over the years, the numbers begin to add up, but the most important number is one. One volunteer, one house, one family, one child, safe and sound, under a roof you helped her family build. Every 15 minutes somewhere in the world, this story is repeated. Together, we can work to eliminate substandard housing. Won't you join us? Support the work of Habitat for Humanity in your hometown or wherever your heart leads you. Now, more than ever, volunteer, get involved, and help build it. Good morning. I'm Danette Baker, and I'm here this morning to introduce the Habitat, uh, the August Mission of the Month, which is the Apostle Build for Habitat of Humanity. Last fall, our church's missions team was offered the challenge by Habitat for Humanity of Benton County to become involved with an Apostle Build in Bentonville. This challenge involves raising $6,000 towards the build, as well as providing volunteers to help build the home, and provide noon meals for the work teams. All funds for this build will be raised by churches in Benton County. An Apostle Build is a partnership that allows individual churches or church partners to join together to fully fund and build a house for a local family. As Jesus' original apostles were charged with spreading the word about Jesus, our apostles are charged with assisting in Habitat's mission to provide decent shelter for God's children. The missions team has been working to raise the funds for this build. We are thankful to the United Methodist men and the United Methodist women for their generous contributions towards this goal. We are also thankful for John Justice for directing the money from his golf ball sales specifically to this build. 
The groundbreaking for this home will be at 4th and Southwest B Streets in Bentonville this next week, August 4th. Our church has requested the week of October 17th or the week of October 24th as our designated work week. This will also be the week we provide noon meals for the work teams. More information will be forthcoming as details are available. We need, to help. We need your help to meet our financial goal to help provide deserving family an affordable, safe, and decent home and to continue to spread God's love to others in our community. Thank you. standing and join me in the call to worship. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. For you let my vindication come. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, Concerning what others do, I have avoided the ways of the violent by following your word. My steps have held fast to your path. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. As 
Let us sing as we prepare for prayer. Get ahead of yourself, Jane. As you notice, J Brother Jamie was in the video welcoming, wel welcoming us today. So Jan and I have kind of switched roles and changed things up for both of us a little bit. So if you would, before we greet one another, let us have a, a quick prayer. Gracious God, thank you for bringing us here together today. Help us to greet each other in your faith and in your promise that you are here with, the, with us, loving and caring for us all. Help us to love and care for one another in touching our lives each day. In Christ's name, amen. Greet one another. Turn and greet those around you.
his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross was incredible. I don't know about the rest of you, but I got goosebumps. I'll be reading this morning from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. Listen now for the word of God. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of everyone, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of countenance the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For like the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. This also is vanity. Surely oppression makes the wise foolish, and a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. The patient in spirit are better than the proud in spirit. Do not be quick to anger, for anger lodges in the bosom of fools. Do not say, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is as good as an inheritance, 
an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money, and the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to the one who possesses it. Consider the work of God, who can make straight what has been made crooked. In the day of prosperity, be joyful, and in the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other, so that mortals may not find out anything that will come after them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If our ushers would come forward, please, for our tithes and offerings. It's the time of our worship service where we practice the means of grace of giving, of giving a tithe or an offering of a certain amount or percentage of what God has given us. It is your opportunity to find a little about God, find out what God wants you to give in your life. We do like to encourage everyone, if you have an extra dollar in your pocket, to just add that little extra dollar. If there's anything you'd give, give that dollar so they can go to missions around the world. Gracious and merciful God, please accept these gifts, these offerings that have been given this morning. May they be for your kingdom and your glory. In Christ's honor, amen.
may be seated. I regret to, to tell you that Cliff Jenkins passed away yesterday morning at 6.30. I know that most many of you know that, but uh, please keep Pat and, and the whole family in your prayers as, as they go through these next days and weeks and, and months of grief. Also, we have uh, Dortha Spring, who is at Jamestown Rehab. Uh, Jean Jackson is at Mercy Hospital. And I want to ask you to especially keep B.J. Rainey in your prayers. She is, uh, hospice is with her now, but she has chosen to be at home. Uh, and we may see her in church uh, from time to time, but, but she and her family especially need our prayers as well. So, so we'll ask you to keep all of them in your prayers, if you will. And if now we begin our prayer time with a song. join together in prayer. Gracious and wonderful God, we come to you this morning lifting up in prayer all of those who are sick, who are ill. We particularly, Lord, lift up those who know their time is short. Comfort them, comfort their families. We pray that your spirit would pour down on them, help them understand that you are there with them, that you are the ultimate healer, that your son was the ultimate gift. Lord, we pray for healing and comfort around the world as countries and people struggle, as wars continue, as protests continue over freedom, over religion, over knowing who they are or who people want to be. God, we give you thanks that we are here, that we can worship here this morning, that we can lift your name in praise, that your spirit can fall upon us, that we can be here in comfort and in joy. We're thankful to be your people. May our worship here today be a blessing for you and we pray that as we gather every day not just Sunday that we can be a blessing for you and a blessing to our community Lord help us to open the doors to our church to make sure that those around us know that we are here for them that this building is not simply ours but is for you our God and for all your children Help us to move out through the community, spreading your word that Jesus Christ is Lord, that your Son came as God and fully human. Help us to spread the good news that you are our God. All these things we pray this morning as the Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Amen. So what is it about a name? If you looked at the bulletin, that's the name of the sermon this morning. What is it in a name? If you've gone to any of the getting acquainted events there on our calendar, that there's the GA events, getting acquainted. Brother Jamie and I get a few questions every time. They don't ask me about my name, but my name, not my, sometimes they do, the origin or whatever. I'm not real sure of the origin of my name. It is spelled M-Y-A-N-E. It's not the M-A-Y. It's not Maine. It's my Um I've been called all kinds of things, Miani, Miani. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't make a big difference. I like to be called Lee or Pastor Lee. Brother Jamie always gets the question, well, why not Pastor Jamie or Pastor Alexander, why is it Brother Jamie? And some of you have heard this, but he comes. But he's got several answers, but the one I like is he said, well, with the name Jamie, I just want it to be clear that I'm Brother Jamie, not Sister Jamie. <laughs> so, you know, there's names mean things. They may have a meaning or they may just mean something. You know, family history, we see now that, uh, you know, the, they talk about the modern family where, a parent has become divorced and they've had children and now there's a new parent and then the other parent gets married. So children have one mother, two mothers, two fathers. Things go on and what are the names? What's my name? It gets a little confusing. We have a lot of people here in the village that have remarried after retirement. Names have changed again two or three times. People here, we have children that uh, are not your children. They come to see you. They're their husband's children or your wife's children. There's all kinds of things with names. I had the reading out of Ecclesiastes today because of the name Ecclesiastes in a lot of ways. I like the book. At seminary, we always had to say Kohelet. That's the Hebrew translation. So in Greek, it's Ecclesiastes. In Hebrew, it's Kohelet. And none of them are a name. They're actually a title. It's more of, means the preacher or somebody that gathers people together to speak or the teacher. So Kohelet or Ecclesiastes is a name that has great meaning. And I like the book. It's a book that you either love or you hate, I think, because when he begins that the vanity of all vanities and goes into all these things and the difficulties of life, it can be a little worrisome. But I like it because it goes up and down. For me, it's a very realistic book. I like to read it because I know that life is difficult sometimes. And I realize that when I read Ecclesiastes that this person realized how difficult life was and this person struggled with God and put that in paper and it made it into scripture it made it into the canon of our Bible so that name is important to me our story this morning that I haven't read yet in Genesis chapter 32 is about Jacob we'll get into who Jacob is in a minute but let's Let's read our scripture right now, and we find Jacob in the middle of a river. And it says, That same night he, Jacob, got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and he crossed the ford of the Jeb Jebok. This is a river. And he took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel. And there he, I'm sorry, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. It's the word of God for the people of God this morning. Thanks be to God. Well, to understand who Jacob is, we have to back up a little bit. And I want you to think about, we've just talked about these names that we understand and our, you know, we call it the modern family maybe. Well, let's go back about 4,000 years and let's look at the modern family. If you look, Jacob is the son, go back to, what is it, oh, page 20, or chapter 26, 27, Jacob is the son of Isaac, and he has an older brother Esau. 
So let's just take up the story where Isaac is dying. He's on his deathbed. He's blind. He can no longer see. And he's decided that he's going to bless his older son Esau. He's going to give him his inheritance. It's time. It's time for him to do that. Well, he tells Esau to go kill the, uh, some game for a meal so they can celebrate. And his wife hears of it. Well, here's our modern family. She says, well, I'll go get Jacob. And she goes and gets her younger son, Jacob, and says, listen, your dad's going to give away the inheritance. He's fixing to bless Esau. I don't want that to happen. I want you to receive the blessing. So she contrives this plot to dress him up like Esau and take him to Isaac for the blessing. Now this is no easy feat. Jacob's already said, hey, dad's going to, you know, he's gonna, he can't see, but he'll recognize me because Esau's a big hairy guy. You know, I'm a little kind of skinny, plain skinned guy. His mom takes care of that. They get the goat skin, they put it on his hands, put it on his neck. They take him in and Esau, or, uh, Isaac's a little skeptical. You're back awfully soon, but okay. And he starts questioning those. You know, you, you kind of sound like Jacob. You smell like Esau, you feel like Esau, but you smell like Jacob. And then's where Jacob really gets in trouble. His dad asks him, says, well, who are you? He says, well, I'm Esau. So he blatantly lies to his father, and his father blesses him right there. Esau comes in later with the real uh, meal that he'd killed for his father and prepared it to celebrate. And Isaac's uh, looking at him, says, well, or trying to look at him, says, who are you? Well, I'm Esau. And then he realizes what's happened. He realizes he's been tricked. It's right out of Desperate Housewives, don't you think? I mean, you know, this is, a, this is the modern family here 4,000 years ago, right? It's a soap opera. Well, Esau's mad, and he's ready, to, you know, he's ready to kill his brother. So what does Jacob do? He grabs everything that has been his, that's his, that his father's blessed him with, and he leaves. His mother makes arrangements for him. She said, go to uh, Haran, I believe it is. Go to another country where is her brother is, Jacob's uncle, and said, he'll find you a wife there. He'll take care of you. Get out of town. So Jacob has grabbed everything and run out of town. And here's the good part of the, you know, the soap opera. I know a lot of you are from Iowa and up north and Kansas and even Texas all around. I'm from Arkansas, and we get picked on a lot about, you know, the cousin thing and who you marry. Well, the first girl that Jacob sees in, in, when he meets his uncle is his cousin, right? And they, you know, that she becomes his wife. So this is biblical. You cannot make fun of us in Arkansas anymore. I did not marry my cousin, by the way. All right. But anyway, Jacob is, you know, this is who he is. I mean, he has grabbed stuff from his father. His mother has helped him. It's kind of a, you know, the modern family. And he's run off to his uncle, sees his cousin. He's ready to get married. And he makes a deal says, with his uncle. Said, uh, his uncle says, you work for me seven years, you can have... Uh, Rachel to marry. So he does that. Well, then turnabout's fair play, I guess. He gets ready to get married, and his uncle sends Leah, the older sister. And he's like, oh, well, hey, this wasn't a deal. And he said, well, we can't marry the, elder, the younger sister before the older. Can't do what you did. Get the blessing before. So he does that. He says, another seven years, you can have Rachel as your wife. So he does that. Fourteen years. And Jacob is there with his uncle, and all he does a lot. They have children, and and you know, in the old time, in the biblical times, they had more than one wife. So he has two wives, and then the maids become his wife. Rachel can't have kids, so he has wife, uh, uh, children with the, the maids. Sounds a lot like his grandfather Abraham, if you start thinking back. But all this goes on, and he's finally he's kind of ready to leave, but he really doesn't have stuff. He's been working for his uncle. He has wives, and he's, his uncle says, "Well, what are your wages? What do you want? You work for me a little bit longer, we'll make a deal." So his uncle works it out, and Jacob says, well, how about if I take all, if I work for another three, three to five years, I'll take all the black lambs, and any of the lambs that are striped or, or have black spots on them, something like that. You know, he's kind of thinking, that doesn't sound too bad. His uncle says, okay. Well, then we hear this story. This is an odd story, but Jacob gets a staff, and he puts paint around it in stripes and lays it before these sheep. And then later he puts spots on the staff, and he lays it before the... And so they start having black calves, and they have sheep. And all of a sudden, his uncle's sheep are no longer white and black. They're all Jacob's sheep. So he's tricked his uncle out of his fortune now, right? What do we do with this guy, Jacob? He's stolen the blessing from his brother. Now he's kind of tricked his uncle. His uncle's gotten a pretty good deal. He's taken care of his flocks for about 20 years now. But all of a sudden, Jacob's got... 
He knows he's in trouble. His uncle has figured it out, so he heads out of town again. Nowhere to go but back home. He's heading out. His uncle comes and catches him. They have an agreement that they're not going to fight. He continues on, and that's where we find him. When we began our scripture reading today, we find Jacob trying to cross a river going back home. But he's not just crossing the river. He's heard beforehand that his brother is waiting. Esau, his older brother, is waiting. But he's not just waiting, he's waiting with 400 folks. So Jacob's wondering, well, are these 400 folks going to kill the fatted calf or feed me to the fatted calf? What's going to happen? Am I going to be killed? So he devises a plan and he starts sending... Before we begin our, our scripture today, he starts sending everything he owns across the river. He's sending it all. I think a group of about five groups go across. So we think about it. What would you do? You send your motor home over, right? Your biggest possession. You send it over to your brother and say, listen, take it. Don't kill me. Then you send over your cars. Next comes the furniture and the television, right? The next group of things. We hold everything back. You know, the last, next to last group, you put the golf cart, the golf clubs, the good stuff, right? I know how we work here. But that last group, that's his family. 20 years, he has four wives or more, and all these children, they go. Then we're left with Jacob in the river. It says he's all alone. He's come to a place where he has no idea if those in front of him have survived. I mean, he stole everything and left town. Twice now. He has no idea if his brother's going to kill all of them, take his possessions, burn them to the ground, throw them off a cliff. He's standing in the river. And this is where we find out what's in a name because this is Jacob. As he struggles, you wonder. I, I'm a very visual person. I wonder if you see him in the middle of the river struggling with an invisible man. Is he stri- struggling with God and lightning? But obviously he's struggling, and I think he comes to the realization that I've stolen these things. I've stolen my blessing that I have, and God has been faithful to me. Jacob was not an unfaithful man. I mean, in all his travels with his brother or to his uncles, he dug wells and he had altars to God, and he knew God. This is not an ungodly person. But in the river, he comes face to face with all that he has been and in all he will be. And as they wrestle, he won't let go. I say wrestle, just wrestle, wrestle. I got the kids were making fun of that. If I say wrestle, forgive me. It's wrestle, wrestling. But he's wrestling with God. Often we think that wrestling with God may be not a good thing, but Jacob is hanging on for dear life because he knows that Coming out of this river may be the end. And as the wrestling comes to an end, he realizes he's with God, not just a man, and he becomes, he asks for this blessing. And so, what does it mean to be renamed from Jacob to Israel? And this is a big deal. In the Bible, I mean, we're always talking about Israel, the country, Israel, the person. We talk about our God is a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, if you look at Jacob, the understanding of this name is a grabber. He's someone that has grabbed things. In our life, I look at what all I have grabbed. I have gone from owning lots of things to very little and back and up and down. In this economy we've had, we all worry about our houses and Will we be able to sell it when we need to? We grabbed on to things. We even grab on to this sanctuary at times and think it's really ours. We grab this church and claim it for our own, but it's God's. We should let it be God's. Well, Jacob has grabbed all these things and now he's named Israel. All he's grabbed is across the river. So what does Israel mean? Israel means wrestle with God. Jacob has found that in the river of life, in crossing these rivers of difficulty, that God is there. That if you grab on to God, maybe you'll get a blessing. 
But maybe all that I've grabbed on before is not the blessing I needed. That this is the blessing, the time that I spend right now in the turmoil of life is the blessing. The time that I find where I wrestle with God is my blessing. We often look at those times in our lives that are most difficult. We all cross some kind of difficulty every day. And we look at them and think, well, I want out. I want to go away. I want to go back to what's comfortable. Yet, God calls us to be Israel. God calls us to wrestle with God. To be in participation with God. We think of God as loving us, and God does love us, but God wants more than all anything with His love for us to participate in life with Him. To be there and hold on desperately, and we will be saved. The river represents for Jacob moving on. The crossing over, going back home to face what he had done. And grabbing on to God, he is blessed with a new name. From grabber to wrestler, to someone who loves God and hangs on to God. When he gets out of the river the next day, he finds his brother there with all the things. Jacob gives him everything that he owns, and his brother says, No, I have enough. You can have it all back. Jacob is blessed fivefold by walking through the torment of life with his God. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us to define our names. Help us to know who we are, to understand our history, and to look back and find those hurts that need healing. Help us to step into your river, to hold on to you as you pull us through, whether a tiny stream or a strong flood. We thank you, God, that you are with us this morning, working with our lives, loving us, completely. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we sing the first and last verses of our, our final hymn, number 351, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, know that you're welcome at any time to join our congregation through profession of faith or baptism or transfer of letter. This time at the end of the service is your time. If you need time to pray here at the altar rail, it's yours. I also invite you that any time during the week you'd like to come and pray that the doors are open. Come in here. It's quiet and cool out of the sun and spend some time with God.
Know that whatever rivers you have to cross this week, that God is there with you. Grab hold and spread the word. The good news of Christ is here. Amen.